So okay, so what what band or artist inspired you to become a musician? Well, actually, the first music that I grew up on was uh, the first music I heard, I should say, was jazz from my dad's side and oldies from my mom's side. We had a TV in the house, but it was never really on. Music was always played. So there was no other thing for me to do than play something. Um, and I would listen to my mom's oldies, and I would always hear in the background something that moved me, which was obviously James Jameson's bass. Um, I didn't know what it was because I was small, but it definitely grabbed me. Then uh, my dad was a jazz musician. He played jazz saxophone and jazz clarinet. So he'd be noodling around in the room and I'd hear it. And when he would stop, he'd throw on albums like Chicago, Earth, Wind and Fire, Tower of Power, and uh, things like that. More, what would I say? It wasn't prog yet. You know, and there'd be some Zeppelin. And then I remember one time he came home and he put this album on and it, I believe it was Fragile from Yes. And that was it. I connected that bass sound with the oldies and I go, I don't know what that is, but I want to do that. So I'm not a guitar player that was in a band that needed a bass player and I switched over. From the get-go, I'm a bass player. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much what did it. Then later on, he brought home another album by a little band called Rush, and that was the end. Of, that was the end of everything for me, <laughs> pretty much. Um, and I thank both my parents for that because, you know, I could now I look back and go, wow, I wish I knew. I knew. I wish I was listening to, or listening for, I should say, what I hear now in records. But they definitely talk, they definitely grab me. So yes, I'm a bass player, off, right off the bat. So, going back to your dad, what bands in the local music scene was your dad listening to and was he playing in this local scene? He, he was, uh, you know how they have open mic nights? He, there was back then in, in the late 60s, early 70s, there was a lot of clubs in the Upland area, you know, and out here in San Dimas that were jazz clubs. And jazz musicians are very mm -hmm. on point. And my dad was pretty much on point. I could just jump up there and slam out a tune and just be happy. He wasn't officially in a band, but he could get up there and hammer it up on a clarinet or a saxophone. So um, he gave me the confidence of, don't if you're going to be a musician, don't do it half-ass. Do it full tilt. And um, so I got that from him. <laughs> I got that from him. And you know, when I was small, I met musicians at you know, different studios. Francisco Studios was opening up back then. And I met, I met the guys from War, I met the guys from Malo, but I was a little guy, mm -hmm. you know, and I wish I would have met them now. Like I said, when I'm older, yeah. I would have been like the girl in the Beatles videos, you know, like that. <laughs> but back then it was just guys my dad knew. Yeah. So that was pretty, now that I look back, it's pretty amazing, but I, had in front of me, right. said I think, like I said, every time something happened, I think a little piece got stuck to me, and pretty much made this. Fast forward to 1985 or 80, let's say 1980, fast forward 1980. What are you doing in 1980, and how did your musical uh, direction change? Well, when my dad, when my dad, back to my dad, when my dad first put a uh, put on a Black Sabbath album, it was a whole different animal than what he normally was playing or you know listening to. It was pretty dark to me, but I dug it. It brought something else out of me, and something stuck to me. It was like, oh, 
this is some cool shit right here, yeah. you know? And musically, it was like, oh, this is like, there's that bass again, you know? Yeah. So, um, I started getting into heavier stuff, you know, and there was record shops, and there was Private Eye, there was Private Eye, there was places, you know, that uh, had, you know, harder, darker music. So I'd wander in there and, like any other guy back then, would buy an album or a cassette because of what was on the cover. <laughs> Take it home, and we heard stuff, you know? Yeah. We heard different, different shit just because we bought it because how evil was the cover. Yeah. And um, there was different places, you know? Uh, like back then there was the warehouse, Music Plus, yep. uh, uh, Lakers Pizza, yeah. Lakers Pizza. Um, and places like that that didn't have that much of the heavy stuff, mm -hmm. but there was shops popping up that did. Yeah. So that kind of kind of gravitate towards those, yeah. go towards those. And like I said, I was hearing Venom, I was hearing Merciful mm -hmm. Fate, I was hearing Exciter. Mm -hmm. You know, I was hearing stuff like that. And uh, then of course came Slayer, Possessed, mm -hmm. and it just kept getting darker and darker. And I was okay with that. <laughs> I was all right with it. Then I heard ba local bands. <laughs> was it in the picture? Was it no. Uh, oh. And I heard local bands, and I uh, was like, "Oh, I can actually talk to these guys after the gig." You know, I yeah. was going to clubs and stuff. Yeah. Then it was like, "Oh, these guys are playing music I dig," and um, I, they're right here. <laughs> You know, what, what were some of the bands or locally that you were listening to? Was like Armored Saint? Or? It was it was Armored Saint. There was uh, uh, actually one of the one time uh, there was a private party and Armored Saint played there, and um, I got to talk to them. It was a place called the Green Door in Montclair, and I actually got to talk to them and meet them. You know, and I hung out with Dave. Rest of rock and peace, Dave. Yeah. And uh, it was one of those things where, like, well, bands that I'm listening to are right here. You know, there, there was there was Avatar, but there was Age of Steel. You know, there was Evil Dead. And all these bands that I could actually like watch them play, get inspired, and then after they were done, go up and shake their hand yeah. and say, "You rock the shit out of the stage." Yeah. You know, it was a cool vibe. When uh, some other bands would come through town, I remember Exciter came through one time, and uh, cool as shit, yep. cool as shit, no attitude, just hey man, thank you for having us. Yeah. You know, I was like wow, this is just pretty fucking amazing, you know. Yeah. And then, like I said, then there was Possess, um, Metallica. You know, I heard later on actually, it was just I don't know why, but it just so happened, like I said, they must have not had. The evil cover. <laughs> the, they did probably didn't have the most evil cover, you know. So uh, I heard them later on, but then I saw Agent Steel at the Troubadour. Blew my fucking mind. Blew my fucking mind. And uh, they were cool as fuck after just hanging out. Yeah. And that's when I realized, like, you can be a badass and not be an asshole. You know, you can be a badass and, you know, the, those are the people that are going to dig your shit, but if you're an asshole, are going to say, fuck your shit, you know? Yeah, right. So, you get, you got to decide right there, Yeah. how's it going to be? Yep. And Agent Seal proved to me that you, you, know, you don't have to be an asshole. <laughs> so great. So, uh, what are your thoughts right, right now on the uh, San Gabriel Valley music scene? Uh, before and to now? Well, now that I live in Alhambra, um, I know that they're still here. You know, I know that I know the sound of all is right, right behind <laughs> this theater right here. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, up, there's bands around here, but there's no place for them to unfortunately play. So if I hear a good band, I usually ask them, where are you from? You know, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of times they're from out here, mm -hmm. and you just didn't know it. You know what I mean? Like I said, there's no place. It's all covers now, man. It's all co covers and tribute bands, and 
You know, I, I mean, it's great to see a tribute band, but I can sit here and drink a beer and listen to the CD of the originals, you know, and not pay ten bucks for a beer, and you know, and and I still I still support the scene, but if there's no place locally, you know, I got my I got my gig of fixing guitars and stuff, yeah. and I work all hours. You know, people need stuff pronto. You gotta fix it pronto. Yeah. You know, right. somebody gets dropped off in the middle of the night, they want it by the morning, I can't go to that gig, unfortunately. Yeah. So, it's not that I'm not a supporter. I will always support local bands, mm -hmm. friends' bands, and whatever I can. But I do have that gig of, you know, maybe I'm helping them have a better gig because their guitar broke or something. Right. So, right. it's not that I'm not antisocial. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I got to do what I got to do too. So when I do make it up to gigs, I, you know, I'll grab a shirt, I'll grab a CD, and that's that's the way I think it should be. How how did how does um, your your music repair business, all of that, how does that dovetail into the local music scene? People re people rely on you, and how did you get into all the repair scene? That was that was a time. <coughs> excuse me. Well, I, I was actually staying at our studio in Francisco Studio, and there's bands going 24/7. Well, if somebody's guitar jack breaks at 3:30 in the morning, guitar center's not going to help you. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to help you. But Johnny's Guitar Garage was open. He could knock on my door. Yeah. And I solder you up. Right. So I gathered a pretty good amount of, what would I say, not, they're friends, but business also, you know. Right. And when I moved out and came here to Alhambra, a lot of them still need, you know, yeah. need their stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm still here, you know. And I do my thing, and, you know. My hands almost like this from a soldering iron, you know? <laughs> um, but I'm not complaining. I love it. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a couple of times where like uh, I go to practice and my bass is making a weird noise, but it's like an, it's like the mechanic's car not running right because he doesn't want to deal with his own car. <laughs> Every he fixes cars all day, or the, the the you know the the guy that mows lawns has the worst lawn in the dead lawn in the yard. Right. Um, you know, the gardener, the gardener's got the worst lawn, you know. So sometimes I go, wow, I forgot to fix my own shit, you know. Okay, okay, okay. But there's no complaints, man. I love it. I get to I get to meet new people. They hang out, drink a beer with me. If it's an easy one, you know, I'll do it while they're here. Right. And off you go. And then they tell friends and so on and so on. And so I have no complaints at all. But what are you doing musically? Musically, I'm in two bands. I'm in, uh, excuse me, I'm in an industrial death thrash band called Three Sixes. Um, that band tours and stuff, you know, and uh, does its thing. And I have to give them credit that they are the band that taught me what a metronome was. <laughs> You know, I did not know what a metronome was. I played with some of the greatest drummers, Mars, Rob, yeah. James, you know, yeah. uh, Dennis. I played with some of the best drummers, that, you know, and I'm lucky enough to say I played with all of them. But then a metronome will just knock your head around going like, whoa, wait, wait a minute. Not saying that these guys, all these guys can count and I can follow them, but it's a whole different animal with a metronome because we have samples, and our drummer's just listening to a click track. He doesn't even hear us. So we have to be on wow. point. I'm also the bass player in Necrocesia. <clears throat> Necrocesia is a death metal band from the 80s that's still thriving, can still pull a crowd, and I'm proud to be their bass player. And they're, we're in the process of recording a new CD, and that'll be the new stuff in quite a few years. But it's from the old LA met death metal scene, and I, like I said, I'm proud to be that and who's part the, of that. Who's in that band? Uh, Lalo is a singer. Uh, Willie is uh, the drummer, and Cholo's the guitar player. 
and I'm a grocer. That's great. And I've heard stories about Lalo yep. going to watch you get guitar lessons and stuff like that yeah. too. So see, it's a, it's not that big of a world. It's pretty small, you know. Right. So. That rocks. That's and since great. you know him, you know that that's I'm that part of that band too. I love both bands. They're two different animals, but I they they kill my my two animals. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, they kill the animals I got in with. Do you ever have to turn down opportunities because you're so busy? You mean as far as fixing guitars? No, as far as playing. Um. Unfortunately, yes. Um, because, like I said, I don't want to do anything half-assed, and uh, you know, there's been a couple of bands that have hit me up to start for a fill-in or whatever. And I could fake it, or I could fake it, play a bass solo, you know, if I hit a bad note or something. But I feel, you know, like I should be tip-top if I'm going to do something. And I can honestly say I think in both bands are pretty tip-top. 